Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Merry Christmas again, everybody. You can say it back, it's okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> It's such a blessing to be here, especially this night, celebrating the greatest gift of all, which is the present, not the presence under the tree, but the presence, the, the God with us-ness of God, the presence of God in Jesus. This Advent season, we've been doing this sermon series called The Weary World Rejoices, and we've been talking a lot about the things that make us weary in the world and the gifts of God that, that He brings to us to bring us joy. And tonight we get to focus on the most amazing gift of all as we celebrate Christmas, the, the presence of Jesus in the manger, the presence of God that comes to be with us and dwell with us. And so much of Christmas centers around this idea of God being present in our lives. In fact, as you may know already, the name Emmanuel, you heard it in our gospel reading, the name Emmanuel means God with us. It's all about presence. And Understanding the power of presence is good this evening, but sometimes it's hard to fully appreciate the power of presence unless you've also felt the ache of absence. And that's, one of the, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Our, our reading this evening from the Gospel of Matthew is a classic reading. It's probably one that you've heard at least every year on Christmas time. But what you don't see in our Matthew 1 reading is the years of ache that happened before Jesus came. The years of seeming absence that happened. What you don't see is the years of history without prophets. See, it had been hundreds of years since God had raised up a prophet in Israel to speak to the people. It had been centuries since someone had come. What you don't see is those years of divine silence with no prophets and no words and no answers. And the people throughout those years thought, that that meant God was absent. And the ache of absence, or at least the ache of seeming divine absence, made the people turn to all kinds of different stuff to, for fulfillment and for purpose and for joy, the stuff that they sought in their own lives and that they deeply craved. A lot of them turned to politics. The time between the Testaments was full of revolt and revolution. There was a group called the Maccabees that took matters into their own hands because they had people who had taken over Israel and they wanted to throw them out and put a Davidic king on the throne. Some turned to legalism. That's how we get the Pharisees in the New Testament. The, the guys who are so self-righteous that they've lost all sense of a need for God when Jesus comes. And some turned to Greek philosophy the kind of worldly wisdom that helped them try to fill the ache of absence that they felt, or at least the, what they thought was God's absence. But no matter where they turned, all these things came up short. All these things left them empty because there isn't anything other than God that fulfills the real need. And I'm guessing every single one of us has been there at one time or another. We felt the ache of absence in our own lives. And maybe it's right now. Maybe it's something that's been happening in your life for an awful long time. If you've been part of Christianity for a while, sometimes it's the experience of praying and praying and praying and praying and feels like feeling like nobody's listening. And it's not just you, by the way. It, it happens all the time. And it's happened for thousands of years that the people of God have felt this way. This is the first line of Psalm 13. It says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Feeling alone and feeling forgotten, that is the ache of absence. And, and, and when you've got a friend who's sick or a loved one who is suffering, or you have a life that isn't going very well, and you're met with this feeling of divine silence, there is an ache that goes along with that. That sense of absence brings with it sometimes doubt. Doubts that don't seem to have any answers at all. Doubts about who God is, whether he exists, where he is, and if he does, how he could be categorized as loving. And we tend to turn to a lot of the same things that the Israelites do. Politics, legalism, philosophy. When you hurt, when others hurt, when the world hurts, when we try to fill those things with something other than God, it means that we're all pretty weary much of the time. And that can be, to be honest, truer than ever this time of year. Truer than ever. 
especially if you lost somebody. You know, especially if this is the first Christmas without them. Sometimes that brings with us this, this, this very deep sense of emptiness. Or maybe it's just the sense that something's missing from your life and you're not sure exactly what. If you don't have anybody to spend Christmas with, if you're here for lack of anything better to do, the ache of absence takes many, many, many different forms, but it often runs very deep in our lives and in our hearts, probably deeper than we know. But the thing that I've learned about God through my life as a Christian and my ministry as a pastor is that he very often answers these questions in ways that we don't expect. In fact, it's right here in our reading. It's a big part of the Christmas story. Listen, this is from Matthew 1. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, note that, as he considered these things, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph didn't expect a visit from an angel when he went to sleep that night. But there it was. When he was in the middle of emptiness and suffering and, and, and pain and confusion, I'm sure, at finding out Mary, who he's supposed to marry, is pregnant. He must have felt achingly and completely alone, but that's when the angel f- pops up. When he's wrestling with what to do, God answers. God meets him there in that place in a way that he doesn't expect. With all of his doubts and with all of his pain and with all of his suffering, God meets him there with the good news that Jesus is coming, that this child that's going to be born is from God himself, and that he will save his people from their sins. And the way that it happens is totally unexpected, but it's also better than Joseph could have possibly imagined when he looked at the situation. So here's the thing. When the angel comes to Joseph in our reading, He's answering Joseph, but he's not just answering Joseph. He doesn't just meet Joseph's fears and Joseph's anxieties and Joseph's problems. He announces to Joseph that he's meeting all fears and all anxieties and all problems, all of it in the manger, all of it with the Christ child. Matthew says that his birth was intended to fulfill the prophecy that Isaiah spoke, the one that says the virgin shall be with child and he shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's God's answer to absence. It's his answer to the absence that we sometimes feel in our lives. He comes here. He comes to be with us. He himself And that's what we celebrate on Christmas, that no matter how far we feel from the people around us, from the people we care about, from the people who are in our lives, and even from God himself, God is with us. You are not alone. We are not alone. God is with you. And that seems like kind of a strange thing to say, because if you know the story, you know he went from the manger to the Mount of Olives and from the Mount of Olives to the cross, and from the cross to the tomb, and from the tomb to heaven. So it seems more sometimes like God was with us. He did all that to save us, of course, but but where is he now? That's often the question. See, the child that was born on Christmas makes some promises, and some important promises, promises that he is here with us. And that happens in a way that we don't expect. In fact, we never could have predicted but also in a way that's better than we could possibly imagine. One of those promises is that the Holy Spirit would come to be with us, to make sure that the Word of God was spoken throughout the entire world, and when it is, to make sure that that same Word of God would change hearts and would reshape minds and would forgive sins and would save souls and would make our bodies into temples where the Holy Spirit Himself would dwell in us. God with us does not end in the manger. The manger is just the beginning. He's with us every single time we hear the Word of God because the Word Himself came to us in the manger and died for us on the cross. 
He's with us every single time we hear the Word of God. But to be honest with, with you about that part of it, you could do that at home, right? You could hear the Word of God at home. I mean, you can go on YouTube and find any number of sermons by some of the greatest preachers in the world. You can even get our sermons online, right? So why come here on Christmas Eve? Why come here on Sunday morning? Why come here? It's because the child born in the manger makes another promise. That promise is in Matthew chapter 18. It's a promise that's unexpected, but also better than we could have possibly imagined, that we would have ever planned for ourselves. He says that wherever two or three are gathered, there he is with us. That means he's present here. He's present here in a unique and a special and important way. With us, his people, in us, his temples, and through us, the members of his church. And I'll tell you, that is never more evident than at the end of Christmas Eve service. It's never more evident than the end of Christmas Eve service because what we're going to do when we get to Silent Night is Pastor Brandon and I are going to come up here and we're going to take our candles and we're going to go over to the Christ candle, the white one there in the middle. We're going to go over to the Christ candle and we're going to light our candles and then we're going to bring the flame out to you guys. And from that point, it's up to you. See, you not only get to receive the light of Christ, but you get to be a light bringer as well this evening. You get to pass it on to your family members and to your neighbors and to your friends. Because see, that's what God does in his church. That's what God does through his church. That's why we come here to this place. Because the child born in the manger is present in his church. He's present in with us through other Christians that he brings into our lives. And think about that, because what that means is that he's present to them through you as well. Because we're his people, and we're his temples, and we speak his word, and we bring his light. You know, as a pastor, you get to kind of know things about people from time to time. You get to hear some of the stuff that they're going through. You get to walk with them through some of those times of absence in their lives, some of the most difficult stuff, challenging stuff that they go through. And I've told you this before, but my favorite time as a pastor is when we light the candles on Christmas Eve. My favorite time as a pastor is when we sing Silent Night because I get this great view of the light on all of your faces. And when that happens, I see the faces of people who I know are grieving and doubting and depressed and rejected and angry, and anxious, and abandoned, and alone. Those are the faces that you are passing the light on to tonight. Those are the faces who are receiving the light from you, and those are the faces that the light of Christ shines on, sometimes the brightest. The flame that started up here at the Christ candle gets passed on to you by another Christian and from you to another Christian. And it is a reminder tonight that the child in the manger, Emmanuel, is with us. God is with you. There is no better night to remember that you are not alone. There is no better night to remember that God is with you in his word and in your heart and in this church. There is no better night for aching, weary people to rejoice together in the presence of God and in the presence of one another. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds, keeping them steadfast in Christ Jesus. Amen.